And here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the Dataversity webinar today, Why You Need End-to-End -end Data Quality to Build Trust in Kafka, sponsored today by Infogix. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And for questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to continue the conversation after the webinar, you can go to community.dataversity.net. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Jeff Brown. Jeff is a director in Infogix's product management group responsible for delivering customer-driven solutions across Infogix Data 360 platform. He holds an MBA from DePaul University and a Bachelor of Science Engineering from Michigan State University. And with that, I will give the floor to Jeff to, to get the webinar started. Jeff, hello and welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Shannon, for the introduction. And let me just get started with my slides. Uh, like Shannon mentioned, my name is Jeff Brown. I'm the uh, Director of Data Quality and Analytics here at Infogix. And today we're going to talk a little bit about Kafka and its impact on uh, current, current organizations and what we're seeing in the market and how we help different customers throughout uh, uh, different industries as well. So I want to start off with, a, with a, just a quick stat. So um, recently Forbes had mentioned that 90% of the world's data was created within the last two years. So as you could imagine, this is quite a bit of data being generated, and a lot of that is is being generated from streaming sources like IoT, different types of devices that are streaming data. And even in the corporate world, there's a lot more data that's being moved around, that's being transferred from uh, system to system. And inside of each of your organizations, I'm sure you're seeing this, that the generation of data is, is just starting to overwhelm uh, the business. So most of that, or some of that data, is also coming from a new platform or a recently new type of messaging platform uh, initially created by Apache Kafka. And if we just take a look at Kafka at a quick glance, and some of these uh, numbers are, are brought to us by Confluent, which is, um, uh, uh, does a lot of these different types of studies and, and offers software as well, but 60% uh, of the Fortune 100 companies are using Apache Kafka. So that's quite a bit uh, just in its most recent adoption as well. And if you look at 100, 000, over 100,000 organizations globally are using Apache Kafka worldwide. And I imagine it's a fairly steep slope in terms of adoption most recently, and some of these numbers might have even gone up in the, in the recent months. If we look at a 2018 Apache Kafka report from, from Confluent, we see that 90% of Kafka uh, projects are considered mission critical within the organization. If we then look at what are the adoption and why is why are organizations going to Apache Kafka, 62% of the deployments are actually replacing existing technology. And we're seeing that with our large customers as well, where they're moving from some of the old file-based systems into this new event-driven architecture to to get uh, more data, higher volume, and higher throughput uh, as well. So why are organizations moving to a streaming-based architecture? So even beyond Kafka, J Kafka just a streaming-based architecture. Today we are going to focus about Kafka, but in general we do have a lot of customers and we see a lot of research being done that streaming data is becoming more and more popular even in uh, enterprises today. So if we look at what is Apache Kafka, Apache Kafka is really a real-time streaming message system that is built around the concept of a publish and subscribe. So similar messaging systems do exist where you're either, it's a queue-based type of system, so if you think of the MQs of the world. Uh, but in the publish and subscribe system, you have publishers for Kafka, publishers which are really the creators of the data, the messages that are feeding the messages through different topics 
and consumers on the other end are then subscribing to these different topics and then receive the messages uh, from that different topic. So it's a little different from MQ where you could have uh, a, a queue being sent messages, you could have the concept of a subscriber then taking messages off of that queue, whereas in this new Apache Kafka world, you have, you have messages that are being created and are just submitted to one or many different consumers that can then take the messages off, the, off of the different topic, uh, and they don't disappear. They, they, they are retained for a particular uh, amount of time. And messages are stored in topics across, across Kafka in many partitions, which really helps out a lot of the different redundancies that uh, enterprises are looking for to keep multiple uh, uh, versions of their of their data, so that if anything were to happen in a particular partition, that it would have a, a, a failover. So, if we look at it in a more visual concept for Kafka and just a general data pipeline, uh, if you look at the flow of data, you've got the producers on the left hand side, and as I mentioned, this could be devices, it could be log data from machines, it could be application logs. It could be Internet of Things, or it could be general applications or third-party vendors, and even files to a certain extent could be generating messages that are then put into a topic. They are basically brokered by the Kafka platform. They're, they're published and brokered by the Kafka platform, and the messages are then uh, consumed by the consumers on the right-hand side through a subscription-based type of model. So if you just look at the flow of this chart, you can see that it goes from left to right, and there, this is just a very a generalized pipeline flow, but the concepts are the, are the same. When we talk about producers, that's anyone who is creating messages, posting it to a topic, and then the consumers are really subscribing to those messages, to those topics, and receiving those messages uh, in real time. Some of the advantages that we hear customers talk about are, uh, are listed here. Um, for the majority of the customers, they are really looking for that real-time data availability. So with Apache Kafka, it enables organizations and enterprises through their event-driven architecture to reduce the lag time within the data that's being posted and even move from one producer to a consumer so that data is now available in real time or even near real time as soon as it happens, which allows the consumers to have faster responses to critical data-driven data decisions. There's also uh, the concept of Apache Kafka acting as a centralized access to data. So if you think of that concept in the middle of that chart that we had seen, the Kafka platform gives that central access to the data in one location. So instead of building out uh, multiple integration points, so if you look at the, the point, the, one of the points on this screen on the right-hand side, it reduces the amount of integration points as well so that IT, who is basically handling a lot of the, the Kafka management in terms of the, the technical platform side, it gives consumers a centralized access to the data, and from an IT perspective, there's a reduction in integration points. So if you have uh, thousands of applications and thousands of uh, downstream systems looking for that data, you don't have to build out an integration point for each one of those. Kafka acts as that centralized uh, data, that data platform uh, to a certain extent. It is also built to scale uh, to massive amounts of data, so high volumes of data as well as high throughput. So if you're looking to use Kafka, it is built to handle large, a very large amount of data where sometimes some of the other systems and, and even um, uh, message-based systems would potentially drown in the amount of volume that is being handled. It also acts as a type of data storage layer, so uh, one of the advantages of Kafka also is that it can provide a, a certain amount of data storage so that if you wanted to retain data, retain messages, let's say for a week or a certain amount of messages even in terms of counts and amounts, you are allowed to do that so that if you are subscribing to a topic, you can potentially even go back in time prior to the, to the uh, time that you're subscribing to it to retrieve data and to retrieve messages. And again, if we're looking at the last bottom right, 
there is a certain fault tolerance that I mentioned that is built in into the system. So it provides that additional security of any type of data potentially being removed or deleted or not available within the entire platform. Some of the key drivers to move to Kafka also include uh, the ability to make faster business decisions. So the, the faster the data is put into the decision maker's hands, the faster the decision can be made. So this is also an advantage when we talk to customers, we ask them, why are you moving? And some of it is technical, some of it is, we can no longer live in this batch-based world, we need access to more real-time data. It also creates a unified data hub so that business can consume the data from a centralized point so that helps the different applications, the downstream applications go to a single location to receive the data and to even receive uh, some of the data that might be critical to their decision making and even critical to their downstream systems. It also gives better data access to data scientists and analytic teams. So this is also in conjunction with some of that real-time data. So depending on what type of data your data scientists are looking to consume, they now have access to this real-time data within their organizations because they can have it as soon as it's generated, as soon as it's posted to a topic, they can then consume it and then make decisions, build it into their models uh, so that they can then either train on it or learn from it uh, w w within their systems. And that same goes for the different analytic teams. If they're looking to make analytic decisions, you can have data that's faster and, um, and uh, at a higher volume available to you. And lastly, a lot of the companies that we speak to, uh, Kafka's part of their digital transformation strategy. And what I mean by the digital transformation strategy is that they're trying to move a lot of their on-premises on uh, type of systems to a cloud-based system. They're moving to a more event-driven based type of architecture. And these are large companies. These are Fortune uh, 500 companies that perhaps in the past may have not moved as fast in terms of adoption of this type of newer technologies. But we're seeing that more and more throughout our customer base that as they move to Apache Kafka or they have it in their sites within the next 18 months, that they are that that is a key part of their digital transformation strategy, and a lot of that has to do with the real-time availability of data, and even some of that redundancy that that I mentioned before. However, it's not always uh, rainbows and sunshine for these organizations that are adapting Kafka, as we talk to them. And uh, as we talk to them and, and understand some of their challenges, uh, we've collected some of them here to, to talk about. So what are they saying? Uh, a lot of times, since it's such a new architecture and it's a new jump into a, into a piece of their, of their business flow, that audit is not just going to let them adopt this blindly. So audit will not let us move forward with our Kafka platform without being able to validate the data. So sometimes it's audit driven so that they're saying we can, we, you know, everything looks great in terms of the architecture. We love the concept of having data in real time, but there's no way that audit is going to let us move forward with transferring this large amount of data from one system to another in terms of producers to consumers without any type of uh, insurance around it so that audit needs to know that what was created is being sent, et cetera so that they need validation on the data that is in motion. So if we think of Kafka's data in motion, that the data is from producers to consumers really needs validation before it's being pushed out or posted to some of their downstream systems. And auditability of the data and process is still a very big key focus for the different companies that we're speaking to. We also have uh, several several companies talking to us, several large companies across industries saying, we're moving all system-to-system -system communication from a file-based to Kafka messages. So what we're hearing is that they are no longer generating or extracting any type of data or files in a batch-based type of uh, manner. They're moving strictly to Kafka-based system. And what this means is that it's a, it's a, it's a new 
means of digital communication between the systems. And it, there is a true recognition of real-time data access. So this may be driven by business saying we need the data faster. It might be delivered by IT, but all in all, they're saying no longer are we creating any type of files and storing it or moving data in that manner. We are moving away from any files and moving strictly to event-driven architecture or moving to Kafka as our centralized type of data hub so that we can have access to this data in real time. And lastly, we're also hearing uh, some, some hesitation as well from customers, from, from this is from, from a large bank. Uh, we don't trust the stability of our Kafka platform to expand its usage. So again, so there's reasons why they're moving and why they're pushing uh, to go towards it. But there's also some hesitation saying, we've got our Kafka platform in place. We're not in production. We're getting, we're ramping up to production, but we're really not moving forward because we, we just don't trust yet. We don't have the validation on the data. We don't have trust in the overall Kafka platform. Not because they don't trust, trust Kafka itself, it's just because it's so new that they don't have their arms completely wrapped around it and they can't get that transparency and clarity of the data inside of the different topics and streams that are being generated and pushed to these critical business systems. So really, they do require insights into their operations. What we're also seeing from customers and from just uh, companies that we're working with is that it might be a new technology, but it's going to be the same challenges that they've seen before. So what we're seeing is that they're running into the same data quality issues, even with their Kafka platform. So if you take the old adage, garbage in, garbage out, just because data is being pushed through faster at a higher volume does not mean that the data quality is any more improved than it was before. So they, I think that's a key concept that a lot of our, that resonates with a lot of the different um, enterprises that we work with is that it is even more dangerous now or potentially even more risky uh, endeavor that they're taking on because it's the same data that was from the producers that are producing the data, except it's now being push to the decision maker's hands even faster so that the quality is still the same. They're not doing anything to the quality. It's being put in the hands even faster. So it's almost like um, uh, turning up the conveyor belt even faster. Data quality is going to be the same as what it was coming in, and it's going to potentially have an even uh, a, a faster response time in terms of the decisions that are made. So we've got a list of questions that we know what the organizations are saying. What should they be asking to sort of squash some of these challenges? They should be asking, do we know if all the transactions that were supposed to be sent were sent? Uh, how do we know that all the transactions that were supposed to be sent were sent? Do we even know when or if duplicate data is being sent through the different topics, through the different streams? How do we know if duplicate data has been sent? Do we know if the data across transactions and even, let's say, the messages, whether it's policies or claims or different trades in terms of financial, was aggregated and transformed correctly? How do we know? So if audit saying, prove to me that this data is being aggregated in the way it's supposed to be, they're having trouble answering that in an honest manner, in an honest fashion, because they don't have clarity into that into the, into the data that's being pushed from system to system. Again, how do we know that all the transactions supposed to be sent had arrived? How do we know that they even arrived in a timely manner or even in, a, in the correct order? So as we're talking to the customers, they're saying, you know, we, we actually don't know that everything is being pushed. A lot of times, since Kafka is fairly a new uh, project or a new platform that they're taking on, it's mostly about setting up the infrastructure, making sure that it can handle the volume, making sure that all the topics are, are in the right, are, are um, uh, being subscribed to appropriately, making sure that it can handle the size of the messages. We're talking to customers and they're talking about messages from uh, three, three, uh, three kilobytes to, uh, uh, to even um, uh, three megabytes. So it's, it's, a, it's a broad range of 
different sizes that these messages are being sent. So some of it is just operational. Can we get it up? Can we get the messages up? Can we get Kafka up and running? But really, when you take a step back, once, bi once the business starts to adopt the uh, real-time data that's being sent over through this new uh, platform, the, this inf the, these questions will arise. So I, n I need to know that you're not sending me multiple claims in the same message or even multiple claims in the same topic or across topics. I need to know that I'm not uh, doubling up the amount of uh, transactions that are in my daily trades and even how do I know and how am I notified if the a right amount of messages came over in the, in the same day? So there's a sort of threshold, you know, a threshold tolerance that's being built. How do I know that the number of messages that were supposed to be sent weren't either above an upper limit or a lower limit that are within this sort of tolerance or threshold uh, within their organization? So there's the whole concept of the monitoring of the Kafka streams and then the context of the messages themselves is different. So there's, there's almost a, an operational view and then, and then a context for a business view of the questions that these customers should really be asking themselves. And so what is the impact to some of these challenges? So if you take the, the negative from all those questions, okay, a duplicate message was sent. A, um, a, a message was sent late or it was incomplete or it was transformed and aggregated incorrectly. From an IT and operations perspective, they're unable to monitor the different data volumes for the different anomalies, like I mentioned. What if all of a sudden the amount of messages, let's say there's 10,000 messages that were supposed to be sent in a topic in a day, and that drops to 100 messages and the customer or the, the consumer was really expecting to have a thousand messages, well, they need to be able to respond to those anomalies appropriately so that they can find out and do a root cause analysis because maybe something is wrong technically. Maybe the data is not arriving on time or maybe their source data isn't being posted. So there's, there's a couple different challenges and impact to the IT and operations. So if we look at how does IT also then predict any of the different data volume that's needed for retention. So if they're unable to monitor the streams and do an accurate prediction of the amount of data that will be stored and retained inside of their Kafka platform, this could be an issue. This could run into uh, some different type of uh, uh, processing errors, a different type of uh, downstream systems that are being impacted because data may not be delivered in, the t in a timely manner. And then again, just having all these different types of monitoring allows IT to potentially identify underlying infrastructure issues. So a hard, it could be a hardware type of issue. From the business side, those that would be consuming the data, uh, you could have incorrect data that's being consumed that you're making the wrong business decisions on. And again, like I mentioned, you could be making decisions faster now that data is being delivered faster. You could also ultimately lead to customer loss. You could have a harm to reputation. You can have revenue loss, regulatory fines, et cetera, depending on the type of data that is falling through the cracks or the data that is not being delivered on time or the data that's potentially being delivered incorrectly. So all of this could lead to uh, a, a sour customer. It could lead to real, real money, so real dollar in terms of regulatory compliance fines. And then ultimately, if you take a step back, what this means is that there's a reduced overall, reduced overall trust factor that comes into play so that the business doesn't trust the data, whether that's to put in the regulatory report decisions on or to do any other type of uh, reporting on so that it leads to reduced trust, reduced adoption moving forward. So how do you build data trust within your organization? And especially, how do you build the trust in Kafka and provide that end-to-end -end data quality? When I think of the data pipeline, I kind of revert back to some of my manufacturing experience throughout my career. I take a look at any of the data pipeline in any business across any industry. 
if you look at the source data that's coming through, when you do different types of quality checks on a car that's being built, you don't put quality checks at the very end, right? So as the parts and as the, the raw data is being, raw sources are being put together, you're doing the different types of validation and monitoring and quality assurance on those parts. Same goes for processing of the parts. So if you think of that in the manner of, well, now these parts are being put together in terms of processing. They're not ready to be packaged up and sent out. But once they are, you've got that QA and the, and the quality assurance that's being put on that as well. If you think of this similar to a data pipeline, you've got raw data from the left-hand side, you've got the source data coming in, you've got third-party data. This all needs to be monitored and validated. You can't wait until the last minute so that at the data warehouse we're actually doing the validation on the data. So if you think of potentially Kafka being in the middle here or even on the, uh, even on the, the bookends of the process, you really need validation and data quality throughout the entire process. You can't say, I'm doing data quality on my data warehouse because I'm doing cleansing or I'm doing different types of uh, validations on it at the very end. By that time, it's already too late. You don't know who's consuming that data. You, don't, you can't track down the source system. By the time it gets there, it potentially is aggregated and transformed in a manner that is even unrecognizable from what it looked like at the source. So from an InfoJix perspective, when we talk with an enterprise or we talk to data strategy teams, we are really looking at the validation and data quality from an end-to-end -end perspective, all the way from raw, you know, raw data, raw source, to that finished product, whether that's in a data warehouse or extracted to a data mart, data lake, et cetera, to your MDM system. We're looking at it from end-to-end, -end, and that's the same way that customers need to uh, Enterprises need to look at it because you can't just rely on it to say, you know what, I'm just going to, as the car is rolling up the line, I'm going to do some QA on it. Well, that doesn't make any sense because you're going to end up with problems that you can't then uh, do anything about because what if it's, um, if you look at it from a car analogy, what if it's something to do with, with, with the engine? Well, you're going to have to take it out, and it's a lot easier to fix it up front than it is to fix it at the end. So when we talk about end-to-end, -end, this is really what we are, we are referring to. From an InfoJix perspective, if we take that producer to consumer type of approach, when we talk about how we provide that validation, that data quality, that reconciliation even, and balancing, we're looking at it holistically. So not only do we look at it from well, you need to be able to get in line to the message before it's posted to the consumer, and you need to provide that validation. But you're also looking at data that could be coming from uh, source systems that are not Kafka messages or are not streaming messages. So you need to be able to provide that data ingestion from all those different types of sources along with the Kafka message so that you can read the data that's coming in from Kafka, so you can, read the, you can read the messages. You can even potentially read in data that's not a Kafka message, aggregate it, transform it, enrich it, and then spit out a Kafka message as well for those downstream systems to consume. So we look at it as we insert ourselves into the key process flow so that you can provide that insurance that the message, the context of the messages is being validated through different business logic and a rules engine, but also from a threshold and monitoring IT perspective that you're able to provide that um, visualization and monitoring of those amounts and counts of the different topics as well. So it's all interrelated in terms of data quality and as you look at how do, we, how do we create a new data quality project, well, you can, you can no longer look at, I'm pointing to a data lake, I'm pointing to a data warehouse, and that's where my data quality uh, efforts are being focused on. Again, by that time, it's too late. The, you know, the, 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 the new car's rolling off the line. So by providing validation up front and as early and even as often as possible, whether it's 
producing systems, whether it's source systems beyond this, you need to be able to provide that level of validation. More so around Kafka, you need, now you have higher volumes, higher throughput, a new technology, business consumers that are looking to make critical business decisions faster. You want to give them the, the assurance that you really are providing them with the highest quality data that's not only from Kafka, but even before that. So if you look at it from before and after Kafka and even within Kafka, that's what, that's what we're looking to provide and that's what has really resonated with customers and, is, and has been successful. We look at it from a multifaceted approach in order to build trust. So from producer to consumer going back. It's not only data quality, so you need to be able to have the conformance checks, the different uniqueness checks, completeness checks, all of the key data quality dimensions that you need to put into play. But you need to have reconciliation. So if we look at Kafka as a data in motion, data movement mechanism, you need to be able to say that this number of uh, transactions and messages were created from the producing system and this number of messages were received from the consuming systems. And they need to be able to reconcile at the counts and amounts and even at the transactional more detailed type of level that it needs to be reconciled and it needs to balance throughout so that you can build that trust within the business so that they can go on and expand usage and trust their decisions. And lastly, even the integrity of the messages and data that's being sent from left to right, if we go back and use that uh, diagram as an example. The integrity of, did any messages fall off? Was everything that was supposed to be delivered in a timely manner was delivered? Again, getting back to the integrity of messages to making sure that I know that whatever my data that is leaving a producer or leaving some of those producing systems is ending up in my consuming systems and even downstream further in the highest integrity, highest data quality as well. So how do you provide a 360 degree uh, standard to data and trust? Again, if you take a step back, you look at it from producer to consumer. So you're setting up the data flow, the data, the data pipeline of the data as it's moving from producer to consumer. But you have to look at it from a top to bottom approach as well. So not only do you need to identify the data that's bad, you need to have a rules engine that's flexible enough to have business users be able to create rules, to be able to uh, transfer their business logic into real data quality rules, but you need to be able to have different um, mechanisms to monitor that data as well, so monitor the stream. So you're monitoring continuously. It's not a one and done. You don't point it at a data source, say give me the data quality, set a baseline and that's it. No, you're really trying to put in that reoccurring monitoring of the data and messages that are, be, that are, being, that are uh, coming through and flowing through your data pipeline, flowing through, flowing through your Kafka platform. So you have, I've got the rules, I'm able to build the rules, Okay, that's great. I'm, I've, I've migrated my business logic into some uh, usable data quality rules. I've got my monitoring, how often I'm doing these checks and what needs to be done in terms of this check first, that check first. Okay, if that fails, what do I do next? So that's more of a monitoring. Who do I alert? Which key stakeholders do I alert? alert? But once I have that data or that bad message that's being uh, uh, identified, what do you do with it? Do you have a mechanism to then remediate that data, to quarantine that data, to then notify those key stakeholders to say, here's a topic that could be then producing a bad data stream, and then split it into a good data stream and a bad data stream, a, bad, a good topic and a bad topic. Do you have the mechanism to keep the key stakeholders and the providers, the producers of that data accountable so that you can go back and say, you are the, the highest offender of the quality uh, that's being monitored in our Kafka platform today, and here's the proof. Here's some of the data. We've got it in our system. It's been assigned to a queue. It's been uh, an internal queue to be worked and through a workflow. You can assign it to users and groups. 
uh, to then look at or even you know send off downstream. But not just having that raw data and having the bad data and having a mechanism to remediate it and track those remediations, you need to be able to communicate it appropriately to through visualizations, through dashboards, through KPIs, through different metrics, and they need to have bar charts and dashboards and line charts and all the different uh, type of graphics that you can imagine within a single system so that all the different roles are, uh, are being addressed. So anywhere, anyone from the data quality analyst role or data analyst role to a mid-tier, let's say, business line manager, all the way up to executive so that you're able to roll up those KPIs and metrics and all the different bad, bad data type of metrics and even monitoring or good data metrics so that you can communicate it appropriately uh, th throughout your system. And so that's really our 360 degree standard to providing that data trust. That's how we view it and that's what, that's what we provide. Infigix provides it through the Data360 platform. So we've got a three-pronged approach to how we tackle some of these items. We tackle it from a data governance perspective. So not only do you need to know what data you have, but you need to know who owns it. You need to know where it's at. You need to know when it's changing. So you need to be able to obtain that metadata and catalog it appropriately, assign owners and do workflow of changes, et cetera. So that's from a data governance perspective. From a data quality perspective too, from a metadata perspective on data governance more so, you're knowing your data. From data quality, you need to be able to trust your data. So you need to provide that data quality baseline. You need to get at that transactional level. You need to be monitoring the data that's flowing through. And that's what we're talking more so about here today around your data quality, being able to build that data quality and trust. And then finally, getting your hands on the data and being able to uh, uh, harness it, be able to transform it even more so within the system. And that's more for our data, data analytics approach. So if we look at data quality a little deeper for streaming data, what does that mean for uh, the companies and customers that, that we're working for? We talk about the end-to-end -end pipeline. What are some of the key functionality features and characteristics that are beneficial to provide data quality on streaming data? So you need to be able to provide data quality on real-time and batch, so validation on real-time and batch data. So that's streaming data. That's files, databases, some of the more traditional types of data in a required time window. So if we're talking Kafka, we're talking uh, fast, high volume. So you need to be able to say, I need to capture every single message in real time. Or if I'm monitoring a topic, I need to say how many messages came through in a certain time window. And even more so, uh, I, I may not need a decision or validation on my data, so I can do it more in a, a micro batch type of mechanism, minutes or seconds or an hour, every hour. You need to be able to provide that balancing and reconciliation like I touched on before. You need to provide the reconciliation from source all the way to target. And Kafka sits in the middle, so if you've got data sources that you're converting to Kafka messages, maybe you want to move beyond the Kafka message and get before it, before it turns into a Kafka message to those uh, source systems. So there's a lot of tools out there that are, uh, trans that are uh, transmitting uh, files and data, database data tables into Kafka messages. So what if you want to get at that data to say, I know that was whatever was in my table ends up at the consumer and I've got validation logic all the way from every, every step throughout that process. Again, I need to be able to provide that transformation and aggregation logic. So you need to be able to be able to, to have that rules engine to be able to transform and aggregate, aggregate the data on streaming and non-streaming data as well. I'm looking to enrich streaming data also. So if you've got different topics that are generating, let's say, claim information or policy information or, or a financial trade, I'd like to enrich that message so that it could be enriched from a non-streaming source or it could be enriched from a, another streaming source 
another Kafka message. I need to be able to do that. So it's all these different type of operational um, um, checks and validations on streaming data and even non-streaming data. And again, being able to visualize, I need to be able to identify and manage exceptions. I need to provide that upper control limit, lower control limit. I need to know if messages are degrading inappropriately so that I can put in some of those key statistical controls to say if over the last four data points, of the last seven data points, five are, are on a negative slope, identify this key stakeholder like some of the Western Electric type of statistical controls that are, that are often uh, implemented. I also need to have machine learning on some of this data as well. So there's a large amount of volume that's being touched, that's being monitored, that's being validated within Kafka Stream. So I need to be able to have machine learning around that to identify anomalies, to identify outliers, to learn from, to build my models in, and I need to have that in a tool that's also doing the validation on that message. So it's redundant to have multiple systems doing machine learning as well as some of this data quality validation if, you're, if you have that, that message and that data in your grasp you might as well do machine learning on it as well to, to build out better insights in your, in your enterprise. From a Data360 streaming functionality, if we dig more into the Infigix product, we're seeing a lot of uh, 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 basic functionality that is, that is very critical. So it can, can be basic and it can be used in a very much more complex manner. We'll touch on that later. But you need to be able to ingest streaming data stores. You need to be able to output to uh, data streams as well. You need to be able to convert that streaming data to batch data. Uh, I need to be able to do some SQL on some of that streaming data as well, some SQL state statements, because I may have uh, certain SQL statements that I want to transfer over from some of my existing checks and I need to put them and place them on some of my Kafka messages. I need to be able to join different types of streaming messages with both streaming messages and batch messages. I need to be able to provide that deduplication of messages that we touched on early. One of the, the key questions that companies are asking, how do I know if data has been sent multiple times or if I'm receiving duplicate data? You need to be able to provide that uh, deduplication type of mechanism. If we take a step back in terms of use cases, like I had touched on, we're looking, we're hearing from many customers that they have both streaming data inline type of validations and data checks that may happen in batch. So when you look at the end-to-end -end data quality on a Kafka data pipeline, we have different customers and different use cases for both. If you just do sort of a high pass, high, you know, high view at this, um, you've got the ability to be able to read messages. You need to be able to provide some type of uh, SQL on that streaming message. And then I need to say, I'm going to push it to the good data. So I'm going to push out a, these are the, the messages that are validated. And then I need to identify some of those that are uh, bad data so that I can then potentially do something with those failed messages. I can send it to a workflow. I can remediate it as well. I can route it uh, or internally, so in internal uh, remediation. Or you know what, I'm taking those bad messages. Don't post them to the, uh, to, to, the, to the consuming system. I want them to go to a topic that only exists to basically post the bad messages or the bad data because I don't want that diluting some of the downstream tools that are then uh, being used to make business decisions on. So this is more of that inline type of check. If we're looking at how do we do uh, uh, traditional types of data quality rules or even some of that more, the, the more reconciliation rules that you may have a static uh, reference data set or you may have some pre-built data quality rules uh, inside of the tool and you need to be able to read multiple messages and sort of aggregate them and, and batch them together to provide an even profile of a potential queue. You can do that as well. So this is an example of I'm able to read small batches, convert them to a batch, 
provide some type of data quality on it, again, push out the past, push out the failed, or I can push them out to a single topic with, that contain both past and failed with an additional uh, attribute on the message that says, here is the status, and it could say past, it could be failed, and then the downstream systems can then do their validation on it itself. So you need that flexibility to be built into the tool so that you can uh, create these new types of topics uh, because you're going to be uh, faced with these types of use cases, um, whether it's today or tomorrow, uh, it's not going to be a fully a real-time based type of uh, validation on your systems. You will have some of this uh, batch type of checks. And then again, if we're looking at some of this a more complex type of ruling so that you're saying, I've got streaming data that's coming in, I need to validate both streaming and non-streaming data sources, and I need to output it in, the, in a sort of a single swoop in a streamlined approach. I may need to join non-streaming data sources with streaming data sources. So I'm taking non-streaming data, such as like this, a database, and I need to join it with some streaming data sources and then output it to, a, uh, to an external system or to a, uh, a Kafka message so that you've got your options on whether I'm capturing Kafka data, Kafka messages from a topic, or I'm capturing files and databases uh, in some of the more traditional types of data. I need that all within a single tool so that I can have all of these options at my fingertips because you could have a large Kafka uh, uh, project that's going on today, and that is the goal is to remove all of the files from any type of uh, data transfer, but in, in all reality, if it's, let's say, a third-party vendor that's providing you a file or, or uh, you just have a, a CRM system that doesn't provide any type of Kafka messages, you, you will be able to, uh, you will be faced with some of these use cases that push in, I need this reference data, it's not streaming, or I need this streaming data to then uh, be enriched with something that is from a reference data set. So you will be faced with these, with these type of uh, use cases uh, within, the, uh, within the overall scope of, of how you adapt Kafka moving forward. And again, just to put in a plug, Infogix provides this as a single solution to build out the data. So if we're looking at data quality rules, so when you're building out these rules, we have uh, over 100 different type of predefined rules that go against a, a single type of attribute. I and mean, we have everything from uh, conformity, completeness, uniqueness, et cetera. We've got the major... Um, uh, data quality dimensions covered so that you can easily implement them. We have the built-in type of validation uh, in terms of the rules. We also have the, the visualization uh, inside of the system too as a single type of um, a mechanism to build out those dashboards. <clears throat> and then above on top here, we have workflow and routing in order to remediate uh, and resolve those, those issues so that you can then uh, do something with, the, with that failed data. And again, don't trust us. We're, uh, we're hearing this from our customers today. So it's not just Infogix speaking. Uh, it's more of a representation of what we're hearing and responding to in the market, right? So we're working with an international bank with over $100 billion in assets that they're looking at doing a reconciliation on their streaming architecture so that they're looking at streaming messages. They're looking at static data. Uh, across, their, uh, across their use case. We're also working with a large financial institution that's delivering, um, uh, Kafka, delivering our Kafka capabilities as part of their general data integrity and data quality controls group. So that's more of a traditional type of uh, uh, checks and balances. And then one of our largest health insurers in the world and a 30-year Infogix customer, we're working with them now to plan for their, their Kafka the adoption in, in preparation for their event-driven architecture that's uh, going through this new implementation within the next uh, 12 to 18 months because they are getting beat on by audit to make sure that they have this validation uh, in check and that they can prove out that their Kafka platform is, is uh, fully secured and fully insured as well. So some of my key takeaways before we open it up for questions is really organizations are, uh, are moving towards 
adapting Kafka. This is something that we've seen uh, across all industries, just as they moved from mainframe to more of the distributed database-driven world. We are now seeing this in a communication adoption that they are adapting Kafka in a, in a pretty, uh, a pretty uh, rigorous type of uh, adaption phase across all industries. Again, the same operational data quality issues as before, garbage in, garbage out. So you need to make sure that the Kafka messages are being validated. Faster delivery, higher data, data volumes lead to data quality, increased data quality issues if they're not managed properly. So it could get out of control. And then lastly, our core message, the entire data pipeline from end to end must be validated, monitored, and approved for the data quality type of uh, basics and steps and metrics that meet your company's needs from end to end in order to build out that trust and to optimize some of your streaming data investments as well. So we're talking from the adoption of uh, Kafka in terms of your organization, but there's a lot of money that's being invested into those different types of projects. You want to make sure that it is the highest success and having validation from end to end is really one way to have business buy-in and to get clarity and insights into your, into your projects moving forward. Okay, so you can find out more on infojigs.com. We've got uh, several infographics, ebooks, data sheets, and blogs that you can use as a reference to find out more about Infojix, some of our positioning on end-to-end, -end, how we deal with it uh, as well. You can also contact me. Uh, my email is below. You can contact, feel free to contact me directly. And uh, we'd love to chat with you and find out more about some of your challenges uh, in terms of adopting Kafka uh, in your organization also or what you're seeing in the market. Okay. Jeff, so I'm thank going you. to open it up for questions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this has been a great presentation. Uh, if you have questions for Jeff, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen in the Q&A section. And just a reminder, and to answer the most commonly asked questions, I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. So diving in here, Jeff, any lessons learned for streaming large structured databases from um, on-prem to cloud? Are you there? Am I here? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was on mute because I was t taking a sip of water. I was being human. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, the uh, we, so we're actually seeing uh, a lot of a lot of that attention from uh, the customers that that we're talking to as part of their digital transformation strategy. So they're moving a lot of their on-prem data warehouse, some of their core business systems that is on-prem, and they're adopting, you know, and we're seeing Azure really take, taking a, a large piece of that market share uh, more recently uh, than not in terms of what the big, big companies are, are adopting. So we're seeing a lot of that. We've got a data lake on-prem. We're now moving to Azure to uh, move that data, and they're building in these types of checks and balances to make sure that anything that is on-prem makes it to the cloud. And again, it's sort of that same left to right. You're, you, you're, you then go into the producers are on-prem and the consuming downstream systems are on the right. So we're seeing the same attention being drawn to uh, what does it look like in the database, then what does it look like when it's posted to the cloud. Whether that's, I just want to know that, you know, you kind of start macro and then move into the micro in terms of when I'm moving data, I look at my database on-prem and I've got 10,000 transactions today. It's moving to the cloud at the end of the day or um, just doing a check, uh, you know, every hour. And then I need to know what's actually been posted to the cloud. That's at a more uh, macro type of perspective. And then you get into, okay, now that I do know that all the transactions were sent in terms of counts and amounts, Let's dig into the context and apply business logic to make sure that nothing was 
inappropriately transformed or uh, inaccurately aggregated. So we're seeing those types of checks that, that are being implemented uh, from our customers that are doing that, got a, a large on-prem type of Hadoop data lake, and then I'm moving everything to my uh, private cloud in Azure um, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in our system. So we're seeing a lot of that. I don't know if that answered your question, but again, if it doesn't, feel free to reach out to me directly. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's great. And so, Jeff, if third party is providing their raw data as files, what's the best way to ingest the data? Are there drawbacks to the um, to lay on the data into a Kafka topic for cleaning and put the clean data into another topic? So it, that's a good question. So I mean, there's um, quite a few mechanisms and in, in companies out there that provide if you're just if you're just looking to move a file to a Kafka message that, that do that, um, but they don't have a lot of that business logic type of rules engine in place. So that when you are taking files from, even if it's on-prem or from a third party, it just depends on the criticality of the data that's being posted to that end consumer. I always like to say, you know, marketing campaign data is a lot less critical than uh, financial statements in terms of regulatory reporting. So you need to get every single piece of data and every single tidbit of data for that financial report right prior to be, being posted rather than if it's marketing campaign, you know, we can, we can sort of maybe be a little more lax in terms of what's being posted to the downstream system, so send all of it. Or there's certain uh, school of thought where you say, send me everything that's bad, just let me know what's bad, and I can then uh, work on it or work with a third party. And again, it's holding that third party accountable. A lot of customers that we talk to say, uh, we, get, we, get, we buy data, we buy data whether it's from uh, a financial provider or, or a, you know, some, some type of trading platform, and we buy it, and uh, it's, it's crap. So we don't have any way of tracking it, we can't prove it, but we know we're paying a lot of money for it and we just need to hold them accountable. So before they ingest that, they say, don't stop it. Don't go, don't do that inline validation where we're sort of playing bouncer, where the validation is playing bouncer to say only let the good stuff pass. Let it all pass through, but push it, push some of it to the side and maybe redundant at that storage at that time. But let me know so then I can I can have that data at the ready to then feed it back to that third party provider and say, the last file you sent me was only 80% complete and I have proof and here are the values. I want you to go back and fix it. That's really that ongoing type of improvement. You know, if you think back to some of the, the manufacturing continuous improvement uh, initiatives, you really want to stop bad data or bad occurrences as it happens. And then that way, if it does happen again, you know what's, you know that it's, it's fixed immediately and it's not going to be, um, an impact downstream. I love it. I think I we have mute, time. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that's good. I was just trying to get okay. myself off mute. <laughs> and I think we have time for one more question here. Um, any uh, insight on handling privacy and security concerns uh, in moving data to the cloud? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, just in, that's just the general uh, privacy type of uh, concern, whether it's GDPR, some of the California regulations that are, that are coming through that will only spread. I mean, security and privacy of data is here to stay. It's not going away. It's only going to get stricter. So as you're moving data to the cloud, you really want to uh, be able to identify some, what, it, what is PII? What is being used for some of our PCI, uh, private or credit type of uh, initiatives. What is our HIPAA data? So you need mechanisms and solutions, and a plug here for Infogix, but you need a tool to be able to identify what is PII, what is sensitive data. You need to be able to know where it's at, who's using it, who owns it, can the people that are using it uh, use it in what manner? Do, can they be approved to use it? Is there a mechanism to allow approval to be used. So there's all that type of uh, rigor to make sure that, yes, data that's going to the cloud. Uh, five years ago, I would say the majority of customers we talked to said, 
you know, we're just dipping our, dipping our toe and, and you know, sort of navigating the cloud space. Now, as a company, as a vendor, we, don't, we do not see a single RFP that does not have what is your cloud option. So with, with the uh, structure around security and uh, in light of keeping your company's name out of the news, there is a, there's a lot of um, security that needs to come into place when you're moving data from on-prem into the cloud. Um, but that, that there's lots of tools to, 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 to keep that, you know, security of transmission, security of data at rest uh, as well. But yes, there's, there's lots of um, precautions to, to say the least. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for this great presentation, and thanks to Infojix for sponsoring today. But I'm afraid that is all the time we have for today. Just again, a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this presentation with links to the recording and links to the slide. Jeff, thank you so much, and thanks to all of our attendees. Hope everyone has a great day. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you.